All right, so hello everybody and thank you so much for joining us for today's SEDS Online webinar. We're very happy to have you. We of course want to thank our sponsors, IIS, who lets us um, produce all of this material for you online free of charge. Um, make sure and check out the website. Of course, it has the link for all of the webinars, but uh, it also includes a lot of the recorded um, lectures and virtual field trips, all of that. So make sure and check it out. So today our lecture is from Dr. Teresa Knoll, who's in the Department of Paleontology at Friedrich Alexander University in Erlangen, Germany. She's currently on a scientific stay at University of Vienna. Um, she received her bachelor's degree from University of Munich before earning both her master's and her PhD from FAU in Erlangen. Her research focuses on the formation of limestone uh, marl alter alternations to improve their reliability as paleoenvironmental indicators. Today she's going to talk to us about testing the fidelity of those deposits as environmental proxies. And with that, Teresa, I will give you the mic. Thank you, Chelsea, for this introduction. And uh, hello, thank you all very much for attending this webinar today. And um, as Chelsea just said, um, part of my research focus on the um, limestone alternations, and I try to find out how they were generated and which processes influenced their genesis and how to distinguish these processes. Um, so, what are limestone alternations? Um, limestone alternations are known from all series in Earth history and from a wide variety of depositional settings, ranging from marginal to full marine. And they are basically rhythmically alternating beds of relatively calcium carbonate rich, more solid limestones, and relatively less calcium carbonate rich and less solid marls. On this picture, you can see me in front of a limestone alternation, and this is indeed a very nice one. It's from Anticosti Island on Canada, and it displays most manifestations of limestone alternations. They vary from well bedded to nodular, and from limestone dominated to marl dominated, and from thick bedded to thin bedded. Their rhythmicity is often taken as a direct evidence for um, cyclic sedimentation caused by um, Milankovitch cycles or other cyclic processes, but um, there are quite a lot of processes actually influencing a few constituents where, uh, which the precursor sediment is actually made of. This precursor sediment um, consists of um, aragonite, of calcite and of terrigenous material and of course of a lot of uh, porosity and one of these few constituents has to be uh, sensitive to the climate change and to all these processes um, influencing these constituents. So um, the question is do limestone alternation actually record these processes and um, to what extent and can we use them, for example, for, um, um, cycl uh, for, for cyclostratigraphic analysis, like here, where the lithological change is used? And are they a one-to-one -one reflection? And how well are phases of um, omission or erosion actually recorded? And why do we always have an A-B rhythm? And why not an A-B-C-D rhythm? or are limestone alternations, as suggested by several studies, rather a result of uh, diagenetic processes? Are the signals disguised or even introduced? As early as uh, 1936, uh, Kent uh, described a mismatch between lithological and sedimentological pattern. And um, this is displayed here in this picture of a mudstone and a rudstone, which are combined into one limestone bed. And thus the idea of shear primary differences, which we can use for um, a one-to-one -one, uh, record um, is simply outruled. And the fact that we do not have a loose sediment anymore, but a cemented rock um, implies already a severe alteration. Um, although researchers agree on the fact that a redistribution of carbonate took place at some stage in the process, generating a limestone margination, um, there's an ongoing discussion um, about the time, the burial stage at which um, this carbonate redistribution took place, and on the primary sedimentary characteristics and the involved processes. 
So um, as I just said, the primary differences are outroot, outroot, and the question is, do we have primary differences with a diagenetic overprint, or do we have a diagenetic overprint of a more or less homogeneous sediment? And there are mainly two models discussing this. One is pressure, pressure, pressure dissolution of calcite and the early aragonite dissolution. And the question is, which one is correct? Because this has severe implications on how we can reconstruct our paleoenvironments. And the first model uh, by Ricken, um, he introduced uh, the term diagenetic bedding and he provided a model um, explaining late diagenetic overprint in uh, rhythmic deposits, enhancing the primary differences by pressure dissolution of calcite during the late burial. And um, in this model, uh, precursor sediment, which has primary differences in calcium carbonate, um, is at least buried 18 meters before calcium carbonate um, is redistributed. And this implies at least 55% uh, compaction um, also in the future limestones um, uh, until pressure dissolution actually acts. And um, he defined this as a self-perpetuating um, calcium carbonate dissolution and reprecipitation process that takes place after a phase of mechanical compaction by lithostatic stress. And in this process, um, the carbonate is um, redistributed um, gradually with the minimum of calcium carbonate in the marl center and the maximum of carbonate content in the limestone center. And um, the compaction is proportional to uh, the carbonate content. And Ricken also assumed that the variations in the sediment compositions are either stochastic, uh, event-associated like turbidites, or cyclic. And he also restricted this model to um, deposits of calcareous ooze and disregarded uh, the aragonitic components in this model and cal calculations. Um, anyway, this model was widely accepted, though it can not explain, for example, why we have uncompacted limestone uh, or, why, um, or why we have um, a highly bioturbated sediment um, that is separated into limestone and marl with a sharp boundary between uh, the two lithologies. And a model that is uh, more concordant with the uh, so far unexplained phenomena is uh, developed by Munneke and Samtleben in 1996. And according to this model of differential diagenesis, um, aragonitic components, which are fossil or mud of the precursor sediment, um, they are dissolved in the shallow subsurface. And um, this dissolved calcium carbonate reprecipitates as calcite cement um, in the near future limestone layer. And um, the future marl is therefore relatively depleted and only consists of its uh, original portion of calcite and terrigenous material. Um, while the limestone has imported a lot of um, calcite and um, is therefore um, enriched in uh, carbonate and the terrigenous uh, material is um, passively uh, diluted. So um, this early cementation protects uh, the future limestone from compaction and um, therefore um, uh, there is a differential compaction in the marl while the limestone is even at the boundary to the marl um, uh, quite well preserved in terms of, um, of compaction. And um, also um, the aragonitic molds of um, primarily aragonitic fossils are filled by calcite spar and therefore we can see them in the, mar in the limestone but not in the marl. Um, uh, the driving mechanism for this is still not fully understood, uh, which fuels skepticism. And there are some other models which also use aragonite dissolution and um, reprecipitation of calcite um, to explain um, this early diagenesis and uh, the formation of um, carbonate rhythmids. And this is, for example, by the work of Wheelie and uh, Leslie Churns and Paul Wright. And they, it's based on a very similar idea, but um, they see the intense loss of aragonite mollusks as the source um, of carbonate. 
And um, they also um, suggest that uh, the dissolution happens in the taphonomically active zone, while the model of Munich and Samtleben um, associates it with the uh, zone of anaerobic uh, oxidation of methane. So um, the question is, which model is correct? And um, also, where does it take place? And um, basically, the genesis of limestone margination is a fundamental question, and it is not fully understood. And this implies possible misinterpretations of paleoenvironmental conditions, uh, since it possibly steers um, sedimentological, um, taphonomical, and geochemical patterns, and raising a lot of questions for each discipline. And therefore, I formulated two main hypotheses, which we will test. So the first main hypothesis for the rest of this um, presentation will be differential diagenesis is the driving mechanism for limestone margination formation. And it steers the preservation and abundance of aragonitic fossils and calcitic fossils and the preservation on, uh, of original sedimentological patterns, as well as the concentration and um, distribution of certain trace elements. So, uh, let's start with the preservation and abundance of aragonitic fossils and calcitic fossils. And um, we start here with um, some deposits from the uh, Permian Chisia formation. Um, it is highly bioturbated uh, lagoonal deposits. And I picked this uh, thin section as a representative of four sets of thin sections. Um, and I colored. Um, each tiny fossil with Photoshop, I color coded them. And, um, but first let's look at the thin section. We can draw a quite clear line um, as the border between marl and limestone, which is already a bit odd for such a highly bioturbated sediment. Um, but if we look at um, this phylloid algae, um, it has sharp boundaries in the limestone and it becomes fuzzy to the marl, which is even more odd. So um, to make um, the difference between marl and limestone in terms of fossil content better visible, I'll show you the color-coded picture. And um, we see um, aragonitic fossils, but only recrystallized and only in the limestone. And these are phylloid algae, um, some indeterminate aragonitic fossils, some dasyclodacine algae, and some gastropods. But none of it is in the marl. Um, in this highly bioturbated sediment, it's, it's odd that none of these aragonitic fossils should have been uh, kind of bioturbated into the marl and brought into that um, sediment. So why is it only preserved in the limestone? If we look at the calcitic uh, fossil that um, assemblage, you will see not so much. Therefore, I'll show you the dark background. And um, if we compare the fossil content here, we see a lot of different um, calcitic fossil groups in the marl, but we see exactly the same in the limestone. And um, this color coding made it possible to calculate the factor of enrichment um, of each individual fossil group from marl compared to limestone. So I calculated the, um, the area covered by ostracodes in the marl and divided it by the one in the limestone. And this gives me the factor of enrichment. And if we look at the Chisio formation, we see all fossil groups are enriched by the same factor. That means we have 2.1 um, more fossils in the marl than in the limestone. And this is true for the ostracods, for the foraminifera, and for the bryozoan. And um, these differences in uh, abundance are significant. We, you see um, here above, for example, the corals, they are really rare, also the trilobites. So um, we excluded them. And we tried this also with uh, other um, examples, for example, from the Yani formation. And it shows the same uh, result. We have um, quite uh, consistently the same factor of enrichment for all calcitic fossil groups. Uh, which implies that we have the same precursor sediment because we know that a slight change of substrate has a major impact on the faunal composition. Um, but all the investigated limestone margination show um, an enrichment of calcitic fossils by the very same factor. Only the Vanitsa formation um, shows a discrepancy and we will look at this right now. And you can see 
um, a layer of bioturbation here where a lot of these echinoderms are brought into and you see a layer of echinoderms here in the marl. So um, probably there was an event where um, some echinoderms uh, were brought into the sediment and bioturbation brought it here into the layer that later on became limestone. So here's a primary difference in the sediment composition. Um, but still, we see a differential preservation of aragonitic fossils compared to calcitic fossils because this aragonitic fossil simply stops existing at the boundary to the marl, while the calcitic one, just a few millimeters next to it, continues. So um, for the hypothesis, the first part that differential diagenesis steers the preservation and abundance of aragonitic, aragonitic and calcitic fossils we can say this is um, confirmed. And um, furthermore, um, if we, if we uh, compare um, the calcitic fossil community carefully, there is um, the strong evidence that it is artificially enriched in the marl due to the loss of aragonite. And um, yeah, so therefore the first hypothesis is supported and we have to be really careful where we sample um, our fossils. Um, do we have aragonitic fossils preserved only in the limestone? We cannot find them in the marl um, if differential diagenesis acts. So this implies a severe bias. So let's look at the preservation of um, sedimentological patterns now. Um, are primarily uh, patterns preserved? And um, this example is again from Anticosti. And it um, shows several storm deposits. And here's a storm deposit with brachypods and uh, some bivalves. And here we have background sedimentation and another storm deposit. Um, but this is the boundary between limestone and marl. So um, three phases were summed up into one limestone bed, and uh, lithification happened angular crossing sedimentary boundaries. And we see that even clearer if we look at the thin sections again. Um, so we move from a uh, raspberry point um, on Anticosti to a strawberry cove on Anticosti. And um, see here this thin section. Um, uh, the marl is composed of brachy uh, brachypods, echinoderms, and trilobites, and the limestone by brachypods, echinoderms, and trilobites, and bivalves and mollusks. So primarily aragonitic um, components um, are again only in the limestone. And um, if we look at the color-coded um, picture, we see it's enriched by the same, uh, but it's enriched in the marl. And we also did the analysis with the factor of enrichment here. Um, it is enriched by the same factor. So we actually see one storm deposit, which is separated now into two lithologies. And this is another effect, um, namely um, the alignment of, uh, of components. Um, the shells in the marl are flattened and aligned, as you can see here. This is the boundary. And this is probably because of the loss of volume of aragonite and um, further um, and later on um, compaction during burial. And um, right across the boundary, um, it's a very sharp boundary, you see a random orientation, but it's basically the same, same storm deposit, but we see a stronger alignment here uh, than we see below, just because of the loss of volume. And um, I made a, um, a theoretical model simulating uh, the compaction in MAR uh, following the model of differential di diagenesis um, here above. You would see uh, um, in the upper part um, the limestone and here the MAR. And this is what happens if we compact the sediment um, we see the components are aligned and we measured that um, for ostracots in the example of the Chisia formation and we can actually um, see that also um, that in the limestone um, the components are much more randomly um, oriented as we would expect it in this highly bioturbated sediment and in the marl they are much stronger compacted. So um, some people say, OK, um, but still there is no real witness to really prove that marl and limestone do not represent um, two different events or settings. And therefore, we searched for witness. 
and uh, we found one. And uh, this outcrop is um, on uh, in Irrewiken on Gotland from the Silurian. And uh, this is a large biostrome um, composed of uh, mainly Halicetus cantinularius, uh, which is a thin sedimentary growing coral and thus very sensitive to changes in the depositional environment. And this biostrome is several hundred square meters large and it cross cuts, as you can see, its circumambient limestone malternation. And we took um, three uh, contiguous um, samples and examined them. And um, here you can see the coralites of the um, Halicetus, and here a tabulate coral and Halicetus again. And we will look at the middle um, part uh, in more detail. Um, we see here again the Halicetid colony, here the Fafocetid coral, the Halicetid coral again, which is partly broken and tilted, for example, here, and well preserved here. <coughs> And um, we can observe some growth interruptions in the corals, both in the halicetid coral and also in the fafocetid coral. And um, we can also observe um, some sedimentary events where, for example, uh, coarser uh, fragments were, um, um, were uh, deposited. And um, I'd like you to, uh, to take a few seconds to think where you would put the boundary between marl and limestone. Probably not here. Um, this part below is the marl, here's the limestone, here's the marl again, but the colony continues across the boundary. And in this micro CT scan, um, we can see the broken pieces and we can actually reconnect them. And as you can see now, and um, this well preservation in the limestone and the abrupt compaction in the mar uh, can only be explained by a loss of volume um, caused by the dissolution of aragonite mud. So we can also see that in the field, um, in uh, another example uh, from Anticosti, um, where the colony can be followed across the limestone, uh, across the mar layers, and we can follow individual coralites. Um, we furthermore did some um, reconstruction of the age of the colony by eval evaluating the density minima between tabulae and we ended up with tens of years for limestone mark couplets and not as indicated by cyclostratigraphy with several thousand years um, for this rather deep and calm environment. And this raises also the question about um, do we rather have a very detailed snapshot uh, preserved uh, rather than a more or less complete but condensed um, geological record. So, um, yeah, these are a few limes to mark couplets, but actually span just like um, 80 years. So, lost in transition is actually the current size of the coral and information about coral growth or pause of growth, probably about diversity, since again, we do not have any information about aragonitic fossils and also the correct sedimentation rate time span. And um, we, we find an Anticosti uh, on that example that in some studies, um, these Marley interlayers were referred to as um, erosion events, but these erosion events, as we can follow the coralites uh, through the Mar layer, um, are not erosion events, but are just differential compaction. So it has a severe influence on how we interpret uh, these uh, settings. And I'd like to show you another extreme. This is an example from a very young alternation from the Miocene Mines Basin in Germany, where pure sands of the gastropod hydrobia were separated into lithified and unlithified beds simply by dissolution and reprecipitation. And uh, this introduced a sedimenta sedimentological pattern where there was none originally. So, um, Summed up, we see a huge discrepancy between the lithological pattern and the sedimentological pattern, which can either compile several events into one bed or separate one event into several beds. It can be angular, cross-cutting the sedimentological boundaries, and it can produce a pattern where there was none originally. So um, this is kind of um, <laughs> severe because what happens if we have originally a coquina-like bed of just aragonitic bivalves? Um, 
we would not observe them in the mar because they would just be gone. Um, a storm bed of this in the mar would just be gone. And um, I will not make a lot of friends with the following um, questions because how can we speak of consistent beds or do stratigraphic correlation um, only by looking at the lithological pattern and not speaking of cyclostratigraphic analysis based on uh, the change in lithology. And anyway, um, the hypothesis, as I showed, um, is supported, even though it's uh, quite disturbing. Um, now let's look at the uh, um, uh, um, concentration and distribution of certain trace elements. So let's go to geochemistry. Um, Aragonite dissolution and reprecipitation of calcite cements implies a major mass exchange that affects also, for example, the trace elements which are normally bound to heterogeneous material. And um, for example, aluminium and titanium are such um, trace elements and they're clearly in heterogeneous material. Um, during differential diagenesis, this aragonite from the precursor sediment is dissolved and leaves the future marl um, depleted with only with its original uh, portion of calcite and heterogeneous material, which means um, uh, trace elements like aluminium and titanium are passively enriched in the marl. And the limestone has imported a lot of um, uh, calcium carbonate, and therefore it is uh, relatively diluted here. So um, if we look at the ratio of aluminium and titanium, um, and because they are diagenetically stable, as I just said, they only occur in one oxidation state and are therefore immobile. Um, and we see, if we see different ratios for marl and limestone, in these um, two trace elements, we can say there is an environmental um, difference in the precursor sediment that affected the terrigenous material. Um, but in many cases, with reference to the studies of uh, Hildegard Westphal, Axel Munnecke, and uh, their co authors, we see a correlation of aluminium and titanium um, showing the same ratio for limestone and marl and only enriched or diluted uh, in their absolute content. And if this terrigenous material um, is not affected in the, um, by um, the in, uh, environmental processes, we do not know if other components, which are aragonite and calcite, are um, affected if they varied or if we had the same precursor sediment, which makes it a bit difficult um, to, um, to, to gauge the, the effect of um, diagenesis. And here I would like to suggest a solution to detect um, these variations in the input of aragonite and calcite, um, as the distance between limestone and marl is steered by the amount of aragonite redistributed, we can actually calculate the vector length between the ratios of two adjacent beds, and which is basically this distance here. And we can then make a thought experiment and formulate different cases um, for the variation in uh, one or more of these constituents and um, how this would affect the vector length, the carbonate content um, in the marl and the carbonate content in the limestone. And just as an example, um, in this case, we have no variation and therefore the vector length would be constant, the carbonate content in the limestone would be constant and the carbonate content in the marl would be constant. And in this example where aragonite varies, um, we would see the vector length are low the carbonate content in the limestone is low and the carbonate content in the, um, in the mar would not vary since the portion of calcite is not affected. If we increase the um, uh, portion of aragonite in the precursor sediment, the vector length increase and the carbonate content in the limestone increase, but the carbonate content in the mar still stays the same as it is left with its original portion of calcite. And and we can formulate different cases um, for variation in calcite, in calcite and aragonite, and um, also some variations within these cases to describe the patterns in vector length and carbonate content in limestone alternations. And we did that for limestone alternation on Gotland um, in Likasam. It's Silurian, and it reveals the following curves for vector length here and for calcium carbonate in the marl and calcium carbonate in the limestone. And um, please um, 
note the thickness variation, which are in the background um, in light gray and dark gray, um, which form bundles, um, which are often used in cyclostratigraphy. And um, we actually see no correlation between the carbonate content or the, um, the vector length or um, the aluminum titanium ratio with these bundles, just to notice. And um, what we now did uh, was we took the vector length um, from uh, titanium and aluminum, which should be um, a good proxy um, since it is um, made by um, diagenetically stable elements and we compared the vector length curve um, for other elements. So is there a variation similar to the one in uh, the vector length curve of titanium and aluminum? And it, um, it shows that the um, elements bound to clay minerals um, all show the same pattern. The elements bound to aragonite are depending on their um, on the density of charge in line with the diagenetically stable elements like uh, barium or calcium um, or like strontium completely show a different curve uh, because they possibly left the system and other elements like um, the ones in calcite show the same pattern except for zinc which is also um, possible in um, aragonite and um, but the other elements from calcite show the same pattern as the one from clay minerals. And um, incompatible elements are also dependent on their solubility uh, or density of charge in line with the vector length curve uh, from aluminum and titanium or not. Um, this means uh, we kind of see a partly closed reaction zone um, because only the elements bound to calcite and clay are actually reliable and all other elements are dependent on their um, solubility, um, able to leave the system or not. So um, we looked at the pattern and the theoretical cases we formulated, and we can see several phases in this limestone malalternation. And um, the, the nicest one is this one um, in blue, where we see actually no variation in vector length, calcium carbonate content in marl and carbonate content in limestone, which in place we have a phase where there was no variation in the precursor sediment and um, still several limestone marl couplets formed during that time. So um, also the main hypothesis um, that it um, um, steers the concentration and distribution of certain trace elements um, is confirmed, and this means di differential diagenesis is the driving mechanism for limestone malalternation formation. And um, I've, sh I've shown you different manifestations of limestone malalternations, which require flexible methods to determine their origin. Um, but still, for all these different limestone malalternations, differential diagenesis seems to be the process in charge to, um, for their formation. And um, I've shown you these different um, cases and how severely differential diagenesis alters the or original sediment composition and thus the record of um, paleo environment. And um, just to show you, it ranges from brackish to deep subtil, subtidal, deep platform slope. And there are a lot of other studies showing the exact same thing. Um, and I show you this because it is not a single case and this is kind of a general process in charge which happens very early and um, this process can can enhance it can disguise and in, can it can introduce patterns um, if the um, signal is strong enough so um, I hope um, I showed you uh, that these um, cases are not single cases or restricted to special environments or time intervals um, and that these um, results are a clear warning signal against the underestimation of diagenetic transformation um, from the precursor sediment to the major limestone malalternation. And with this, I would like to, to end and thank my co-authors and the technical support of our lab and also my um, fellowship sponsors, and of course you for your time and uh, for your interest. Super, Teresa, thank you so much for the wonderful presentation.
I personally really enjoyed it, so I appreciate you giving it today. Um, so everybody, the chat is now open. Please make sure and send your messages to all participants, not just to SEDS Online privately, so that everyone can be tuned in to what you're asking. Um, then I will read them out and um, Therese can start to answer. While you type in your questions, make sure and include your name and where you're coming from. We just like to see where everybody is joining from. Okay, well, our first question is already in, so I guess I don't get to ask mine yet. Um, or wants to know, um, given your geochemical proxy analysis suggests a quasi-closed system, would you expect the repartitioning of carbonate in your proposed model between the beds will result in different um, calcium isotope signals in the mar marl versus limestone? Um, or would it create sort of a homogenization? Um, actually, you see that very often that um, limestones and marls um, show um, different oxygen and isotope um, signals. They are still kind of um, close, but um, they are different. Um, they are um, a bit offset. So um, uh, since we dissolve a lot of aragonite, and um, it makes absolutely sense that this process also influences the isotopic composition. I think, um, Chelsea, you um, published uh, something about that too, and um, um, showing the same phenomena for other diagenetic processes. And um, so I think differential diagenesis is also a process um, influencing the um, um, the pattern of isotopic um, uh, of isotopes, yeah, yeah, and I guess so. Or was really getting at calcium isotopes, which should show um, differences within the, those closed and open systems. Um, okay. Have you guys measured any calcium isotopes on this material? No, um, we focused on the um, on the XRF measurements, but um, I applied for a postdoc project um, for funding, and uh, we tried to look into that then. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'm also looking, looking forward to seeing some calcium isotopes. Good question, Or. Um, so while we're waiting for other questions, and I suppose I can ask mine, um, this is a question that hopefully a lot of people can um, find helpful. But I'm wondering if you had to make sort of a blanket statement about um, these types of alternating systems. What do you think the most indicative or the most reliable paleo environmental proxy would be for the limestone layers and what would they be then for the marl layers? Mm, it depends on what you um, want to look at. So um, um, if, you, if you're interested in, in if you just um, in, um, for example, diversity of um, certain fossils, um, um, you, you need to take into account that your aerogenetic um, fossils might be gone. So it, it really depends on the question you, you, you have, um, because for, um, um, for like um, XRF data, if you have these different ratios, um, you can kind of rely on that. But um, for all other proxies, I would be a bit, diff um, um, a bit careful. But there is a nice review by Hildegard Westphal and um, Fritz Hilgen and Axel Munnecke, where they um, review um, exactly this question and they give an overview, overview um, on which proxies are reliable. So basically every proxy that is um, dependent on um, the calcium carbonate content and is um, diluted or um, uh, concentrated by uh, the redistribution, um, I would be careful with that one. Makes sense. Okay, we have our next question from Fiona in Bristol. Hi, Fiona. She says, great talk, Teresa. Lovely conclusion that diagenesis is all. Okay. Given that you see these effects in different environments, is there a difference in degree between more or less organic rich environments and or those with higher or lower permeability, which is what we would expect from a process um, perspective? Mm -hmm. um, I showed you quickly the picture. I tried to find it again. Um, one second. Um, from, the, um, from the Miocene Mines Basin. Um, can, can you see it? Yes. Okay, great. So um, in this picture, um, you see brackish deposits. Um, so um, there was not much organic material and we had a lower salinity. So I think salinity is also um, uh, an influence here. And um, we see a preservation um, of aragonite in the limestone too. 
um, but it is um, less preserved in the MAR. So um, we, we colored the, or we stained the thin section here with Feigl solution. So all the dark brown um, things are still aragonite. Um, and we see clearly the, um, the hydrobia snails are less well preserved in the MAR than it is in the limestone. And the limestone um, has these um, cement coatings here. So um, this is kind of an unfinished diagenesis and probably caused by less organic material, less salinity, a lower salinity. So um, I think this, this has, a, has an influence, yes. So higher organic material in this case, you're um, assuming would create sort of a slowed down process of the alteration. Um, no higher organic material would cause an, in, um, a, a stronger process. Stronger process. And, yeah, because okay. all these redox zones in the upper part of the sediment column would be kind of enhanced. Yeah. So, okay, Tim Demko wants to know, could we expect similar patterns in freshwater carbonate systems? Um, I have no experience with freshwater system. Um, I know that there are some um, nodules and some, um, um, also some, some limestone um, beds which are um, supposedly early diagenetic. I have not looked into that, um, but it would be absolutely awesome to, to look into that a bit more in detail. But um, I was occupied with the marine stuff. Yes, I mean, I, so I studied um, some freshwater systems in the Everglades and um, you don't have a whole lot of aragonitic material, at least there for me, in the freshwater system. So I would assume that the differential um, diagenetic process that would occur might be quite different because you don't have that aragonite to dissolve and um, reprecipitate. But um, that's what we also know. different redox zones. So yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, so our next question is from Mike in Oxford. Um, what about Milankovitch cycle records? Um, there is um, the study by um, Ivan Leroux. Um, I will quickly um, show it. Then you have the the title of it also. Nope, that's the wrong one. Sorry. Um, yeah, here. Um, this, sorry, um, this research article by Ivan Leroux, um, he did some modeling and um, he could sh actually show that um, you need a certain signal to noise ratio to influence this um, in itself um, kind of independent um, reaction zones in the upper sediment surface, um, in the upper part of the sediment column. So. Um, it is possible to record it if the pattern is strong enough, but um, I always doubt the one-to-one -one refraction and especially um, um, when it comes to lithology. There are a lot of examples where Milankovic is perfectly uh, shown, but I, I always doubt the, um, the record of Milankovic in, in lithology. I think it is behind. So we have to search for that. Okay, Fiona has a follow-up question or a second question, I guess. Um, the Gotland Coralites, what was their mineralogy? If they were aragonitic, why were they apparently immune to alteration? No, we're in the Silurian, they are calcitic. So um, they are basically immune because they are calcitic. So. Yeah, okay. Um, so Paul Wright asks, there appears to be a difference between freshwater and marine systems, but based on only a few case studies. I suppose more of a, just a statement. Yeah. <laughs> okay, um, so Valentin is joining us from Oslo. He says, hi, Teresa. Um, <laughs> classic person, so pardon mm -hmm. my calcareous French here. Um, cheers for the talk. How do you explain what appears to be apparent cyclical differential diagenesis with thicker beds, then thinner beds, then thicker beds, then thinner beds? Um, this is just um, uh, a guess, um, uh, but if you think of these um, redox zones in the upper, upper um, uh, sediment uh, column, um, they are of course influenced uh, on uh, a sedimentation rate, and um, so this could have an influence, but if I refer back to the self the concept of self-organization, um, it, um, it actually shows that as soon as um, in the lowermost part of a, of a bed, 
um, the aragonite is dissolved, then the process jumps. So this is one of the, the questions. Is, is it just really because in, the, in this um, kind of um, closed redox zones, um, the, the process just jumps because of some processes in there, or is it because we have a variation in sedimentation rate or so on? So um, this is one of the questions which is not clear right now. And um, if we see, um, for example, in the first picture that I showed that there is an, um, um, it is limestone dominated or it is marl dominated. Of course, we can say there was a phase with um, higher um, carbonate input or lower carbonate input. But again, the, the change in lithology, why this part became a marl bed and the other part became a limestone bed, I think this is still not solved and I would be careful with this. I hope this answers the question. I think so. Okay, so John Reimer is joining us from Duran. Hi, John. Um, what will be the impact of grain size variation, grain sorting, and associated permeability and porosity variabilities um, on the limestone marl development? Mm, so um, I think the grain size can play a, 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 a role because um, if you have a, a large grain, um, um, the solution will act on a comparatively a smaller surface than if you have like mud sized um, uh, uh, particles. So um, the dissolution will probably quicker. And then if we refer back to when the process jumps, uh, this could possibly have an influence. Um, so maybe a surface volume to area ratio sort of thing to look at. Sorry? Um, maybe a, a surface volume to area ratio. So if you have yeah. the higher surface volume um, versus the same rate, vol uh, higher yeah. surface area versus the same volume, then more reaction sites and then easier to uh, it, it would be a bit quicker and then possibly the process jumps earlier. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, Noor from Hungary says, thank you. I would like to ask about depositional rates between limestones and marls. Um, actually, um, if you look at the example from, from the Ordovician, where the same strong deposit was separated into two beds, or when um, two strong deposits and the background sedimentation were um, combined into one bed, um, there is a high variation of sedimentation of deposition rate um, within a bed. And so this is one of the difficult questions to um, reconstruct if you have several events um, in one bed or uh, one event separated into one. So um, I think this is a difficult thing to actually reconstruct. Yeah, I, I could not say that, um, well, of course, because in Marl, um, we have lost a lot of aragonite and it is um, condensed. So also the deposition rate would be kind of condensed, yeah. mm -hmm. but um, it is it is difficult to to really reconstruct it. Sure. So and I guess it would be um, much easier or much more correct reconstructions, let's say, for the limestone beds versus the marl beds if they've endured so much more compaction and um, yeah. alteration processes. Yeah. Okay. Um, one more follow up from Fiona on Valentin's question: Could um, could it be that the patterns we see imply the redox processes controlling the diagenesis are essentially complete? within the period over which a single cycle is developed and before deposition of the next package? Um, I'm sorry, I have to read the question again. <laughs> um, okay, if I, if I understand it correct, um, the, the package you are talking about is um, like um, if you have a phase of um, um, lower carbonate content like several, um, several couplets, um, um, you're speaking of a, of a bundle, you would say. Yeah, I think what she's asking is, um, within that package of limestone and marl, could it be that maybe um, differential redox processes that are occurring within, within one package could actually create this, these two beds, in fact, before there is another set or couplet produced on top of it? Um, okay, so I think these, these redox processes are kind of um, um, there for all the bats entering this, um, uh, uh, the sediment. So during burial, they all enter these um, zones. 
So um, I, I would not say you, they, they really change between, um, for example, two beds. It just, um, you, can, you can kind of um, dilute or stretch the zones, but um, I think this is a very difficult question which has not been solved yet if, if, um, um, if, if this can be connected. So I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if I understood the question correct, sorry. Um, but I, I, I don't think um, it, it actually can be connected. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, perhaps what she's talking about also is um, we see in some shallow water settings that you have different redox zones and you can actually produce some really significant early diagenetic um, alteration of the sediments. Um, so perhaps something along those lines. It might actually be nice to pair sort of a modern system with some of these older deposits. Um, so yes, we should, we should chat later. Uh, all right, Mike Simmons has a follow-up question. What did you mean by look behind the lithology to find orbital forcing cycles? If spectral analysis of limestone marl cyclicity perfectly fits Milankovitch patterns, how do you think we have deluded ourselves? Um, this is a difficult question um, um, because Really, I, I've seen so many examples where, and I hope I showed you some which were convincing, where um, the, litho the, the lithology mismatched the actual environmental signal. So um, if, you, if you go back to, to Anticosti, where you have this, the storm events, which are kind of an environmental signal, and you would um, try to record that, you would probably um, define different events for the for the one um, event that was separated into two lithologies. So I think this, um, if you, um, I think Matthias Sinisar, for example, he has some some studies on the Ordovician of Anticosti together with André de Rocher. Um, I think they are these are reliable because they look at the larger um, patterns. But if you look at um, detailed patterns and use the lithology, I would be very careful. And I've seen some studies where I clearly doubt that this is a, like sort of a um, small Milankovitch circle or even some, um, uh, some thousand, 10,000 year patterns. So um, this is what I always doubt and where I, I would be really careful. It's always good in these types of systems to be um... Be careful, show some caution. Okay, so Francis from Kansas wants to know, can we estimate how much carbonate for limestoneization comes from aragonite dissolution versus organic matter oxidation? Um, so um, I, what do you understand for, from um, organic matter um, oxidation? Um, because um, well, the carbonate do you mean what originally comes into the to the sediment? Um, that would be the, the calcite fraction, and um, the the aragonite fraction would be redistributed to the limestone. So, um, in terms of um, because all this aragonite dissolution probably happens um, um, caused by the decay of organic matter in the in the shallow subsurface. So. Um, I could not say aragonite dissolution versus um, organic matter um, um, oxidation or degradation. Um, it's kind of the, the process that causes the aragonite dissolution. Um, so I don't see a follow-up comment from him, but I, um, I assume that's along the lines of what he's wanting. Yeah, so it's sort of a coupled, um, a coupled process where the oxidation of organic material is actually um, the helping, the, the helping drive the dissolution. Yeah. Okay, so Fiona says, so the package forms due to redox and then we get another sediment deposit on top. Thanks. Um, yeah, she'll follow up online. So um, she thinks some geochemistry can help explain some things. I think it's always nice to add a little geochem. So. Um, okay, a question from Mark Housen in Bristol. Does the presence of sulfur or sulfides have any effect? For example, could sulfides forming in marl due to anoxic processes soon after deposition then oxidize later to produce the weak acid that attacks the aragonite? So um, it is assumed that the, in the sulfide re uh, reduction zone, um, the dissolution is, um, of our aragonite is kind of still protected. So um, um, 
I personally follow more the argumentation of Axel Munecke that um, the dissolution happens um, below in the um, um, zone of um, um, anaerobic uh, methane oxidation and um, the carbonate would kind of migrate a bit upwards into this um, sulfate um, reduction zone. So um, yeah, we have in these different zones we see in the sediment like sulfate reduction zone or AOM, um, we have different effects, some protecting and um, some also um, dissolving. Yeah, that's an interesting question, actually. Um, I don't know if it's been looked at in the literature, but you could definitely look at some sulfur, uh, sulfur isotope analyses in the cast material of the marls to get a better idea if, that, um, if that's actually causing that or if it's in one of those deeper, deeper zones. Um, okay, we're, we've been told to hang on just one second because we have some more questions. Um, so I had one other question that I was, I was wanting to ask sort of for the, the general listener, but I'm wondering if there's an overarching rule that you can use to sort of like calculate or suggest an amount of alteration leading to the moral deposits. So you have, um, I think you use some indices to try and hypothesize how much alteration has occurred, but um, is there anything you can maybe want to mention about so, trying to calculate that? So actually, um, the, the less aragonite is in the system, um, the, um, the less is actually, um, the less are the, the, um, uh, the, uh, the trace elements, for example, condensed or diluted. So that's good for geochemistry. But um, in terms of um, sedimentological patterns, um, it's better to have more aragonite in the system because um, it will preserve your patterns from compaction. So it kind of depends again on uh, what you're looking. So more aragonite is good for the one cause and less aragonite is good for, for, for the other thing. So um, these limestone marginations are kind of um, so various in their in their way what they what they look like from which sediment they um, they um, origin. Um, so it's it's really difficult to say something general except that aragonite is dissolved and reprecipitated as calcite, and um, this happens kind of uh, parallel to the sea surface. Um, so it is, it is really difficult to formulate um, general um, messages, yes. Sure. Uh, okay, we have another question from Faith. Not sure where you're coming from, Faith, but thanks for joining. She says, Teresa, congratulations on your presentation. Do orbital events have any impact on these LMA formations? And this kind of um, relates to another question that's been um, asked before. And um, I would like to um, refer back to the study by Yvonne Leroux. Uh, which said um, or which showed um, a, a certain signal to noise ratio is needed to actually um, to be able to to have the um, this orbital um, uh, 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 cycle um, recorded in in the lithology. So um, yeah, um, you can have it, but um, it's it's not that likely actually as you would expect. Okay, um, I don't see any other questions popping up. If anyone has one last question, you can send it over. Um, but for now, Teresa, I wanna thank you very much for your wonderful presentation on behalf of everybody that's joining us. Um, okay, one more question from Fiona, um, or sorry, Gordon from Bristol. Is there a relationship between the thickness of the couplets um, to be controlled by the diffusion gradient and thus porosity grain size? Um, okay, this um, the thickness. Um, as I said earlier, um, it it is probably caused by when is uh, all of the aragonite dissolved. So um, it's probably grain size that has an influence because smaller grains dissolve um, more easily. Um, but yeah, porosity. Um, I cannot say right now because um, you would need to, to, to look into that, but also grain size has an influence on porosity, of course. So there would be an indirect um, um, influence, probably. 
Okay, perfect. Um, so everybody, thanks for joining and uh, make sure and come back next week at the same time, um, 4 p.m. UK time, when we will hear from Nor, uh, Nor Nof, which will be um, discussing ancient microbial ecosystems. So see you then. Thank you all again.